Hi, this is Jeff Alpin, the Big Game Hunter, and you're listening to Job Search Radio. You know, things have changed a lot since I got into recruiting back in the Stone Ages. There was a time a long, long time ago where you could go to work at a company right out of high school and work there until you decide to retire. And they would hand you a pension and everything was wonderful and good. Obviously, things have changed. And in that change, unfortunately, too many people conduct themselves like it was back when, when companies actually did look out for their employees on so many different levels. Now, my guest on this show, Kevin Kermis, is a really smart guy. And he's one of my, actually, he's my second guest I've had back more than once. And the first one was a two-part episode I did with Alice Chase uh, fairly early on. Now, on this show, we're going to dissect managing your career for yourself because, unfortunately, you can't trust your employer to do that. So, I hope you enjoy the show, and let's sing along. Are you looking for a new job or interested in leveling up? Job Search Radio is your go-to resource for insider tips on job hunting and growing your career. Here's your host, Jeff Altman. So my guest on Job Search Radio this week is Kevin Kermis, who heads up All Things Career, a digital publishing company focused on the career space. Kevin, welcome to Job Search Radio. Great to have hey, you. Hey, thanks board. for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Hope we have some fun today. Yeah, I'm sure we will. <laughs> I'm sure with a topic like this, I'm sure we will. Right. So l- let me just put it out there. Owning versus renting your career. What the heck do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. First of all, I, I've got to give credit to a friend of mine who who brought this up, and I told her that I would be uh, be stealing it and sharing it profusely. But I, really, what it comes down to is the difference between controlling and you know controlling your outcomes from a career standpoint, and taking a more active role in it, versus kind of relinquishing and giving up that control and being dictated by conditions around you in the workplace. So. As an employee of a firm, you put yourself in the position as a participant in your career, uh, abdicating all decision making to big mommy and big daddy employer. Right. I, I think, you I know, mean, I think it's it's a mindset. Uh, I, I always think back to something that we said in the in the infantry when I was in the military, and that is, as a leader, you're responsible for everything that happens or fails to happen. And that is a fundamental mistake that I think a lot of us can make, regardless of who we are employed by, whether you are self-employed like I am, and I am responsible to those individuals who uh, make an investment in themselves to work with me, or going back several years when, when I had an employer who was signing my checks, I was responsible for specific outcomes for them. And making sure that regardless of where your career is going to take you, because as we see the landscape change out there, we can rapidly move from self-employment to being employed by someone else to making massive changes in terms of our, our workplace and even the verticals in which we work. You've got to take an active role in controlling and dictating those outcomes for yourself. How do you see the landscape changing? You know, you and I are veteran people. Um, you know, I, I know I've seen a lot of changes. How do you see it? Well, I, you know, I, th- I think that it can it can present itself a few different ways. I mean, certainly there is the the relevance of whatever technology or industry you're in, and that where you are creating value inside that industry may shift. Um, you may become more important. Uh, and and may work your way up to where you're you're generating more revenue for yourself. It may become redundant. It may become as we look at more and more outsourcing, offshoring, automation of roles. Um, it could be that that your role is simply no longer required. the the thing The thing that I focus more on is that when you look at I think it's upwards. Well, not I think I know. Last year, Gallup did a survey, and upwards of eighty percent of employees are actively disengaged. There are a lot of us out there that just don't like what we do. 
And actively disengaged. What do you mean by that term? So actively disengaged is you, you're at work, but you are not interested in what you're doing. It's not where your main focus is. It is not intrinsically fulfilling you. You're, you're simply put, not happy. Uh, so if that's the case, if you're running into that, why succumb to kind of the fallacy of sunk cost, meaning I've done this for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I can't do anything else. Where am I going to go? My education only supports this. Instead, navigate a change, start to look at taking responsibility, owning your career and saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy doing this. It's time to do something different. Time to take those steps to control that. I agree with you, and I want to go an extra layer on it. You know, I, I've been in search for more than 40 years now. Yeah. So I remember back in the Stone Ages when I started out that, you know, you could still talk in terms of the person who went to work in one organization and spent a long time there and wound up with, you know, the classic gold watch. And does any, anyone in their wildest imagination conceive that it could ever happen to them anymore? Right. You know, it doesn't exist. So with that being the case, you have to put yourself in the position of being responsible for yourself. Or as uh, uh, an earlier guest of mine named Rod Cologne said in a show that we did, uh, become the CEO of me. Yeah. No, that's a good point that Rod makes, and, and I know him. And, I, you know, I, I would take it a step further is that I think that there is a general misunderstanding and or kind of laziness when it comes to believing if we have X number of years in an industry that somehow or another makes us more relevant, more valuable. And the reality is we've got to focus on those outcomes that we are producing. I mean, you've got to remain a student to the game in terms of whatever you do. Uh, so focus on those outcomes. What is it that you're achieving for the people or the organization that you serve? And, and this goes hand in hand with when you're looking at shifting careers, because that's what's really important is the outcome. Can you help someone forget about how many years experience you have? Cause you, you and I both know this having been headhunters, you currently still as a headhunter, you got a lot of people out there that may have done something for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but they may champion mediocrity at it on a daily basis. And if that's the case, no one wants that. We want subject matter expertise. We want people who are, are basically precision instruments in, serves, in terms of solving specific problems. And that's where you focus. And that, that too is where pivoting from one industry to another or pivoting from one interest to another, if you decide it's time for a change in terms of owning your career, becomes a little bit easier. And I think about that pivot, by the way, folks, in, in case you're just listening to this as the podcast, I gave Kevin a huge thumbs up at one point because uh, I agreed wholeheartedly with what he was saying. You know, to begin the pivot, you know, for most people who are kind of uh, it may have become mechanical in what they do. You know, they do their job, they do it well, uh, they've stopped really thinking about change. Uh, and as a result, it's hard for them to think about doing something different, except to grumble about this isn't good. Yeah. So where do you think people can begin that self-evaluation for change? Well, I mean, gosh, you can start in a few places. And I, I'm an enormous advocate of do what you love. And, I, and I'm not going to give anybody the trite pablum of, you know, follow your passion, because I think that that is that's terrible advice. Um, you can be happy in terms of doing what you love if your work is supporting something outside of work. You know, there are those of us who live to work and then work to live. And then there can be a balance somewhere in between where I tell most people to start and and there aren't a lot of folks out there that start in this place is what does your life look like when you've got the ideal job? And I'm not talking about what does that employer look like? I mean, holistically, what does the entire package look like? Because the job has to support everything else. This is, this is where you run into so many people who have endlessly and tirelessly worked their way up the ladder and they get to what they think is going to be the pinnacle in terms of compensation and role and responsibility, and they're freaking miserable. It reminds me of the Jack Nicholson line from a movie he did with Helen Hunt. Is this all there is? Right. This is it. And, and I'm sure you run into a lot of people who are saying that. I, I've got countless friends who are in the top 1% of what they do, and they're miserable. They're miserable because they're sitting there saying, is this it? And they've sacrificed a lot of things along the way in order to achieve that. 
So <clears throat> that's where you've got to put yourself first. And I think that that too is the owning the career. It's it's beyond just taking charge and and making sure that other people are not always kind of dictating and taking control of, of where you're headed and what you're doing, but really looking at, does this serve, you know, if, am I going to look back? I, I look at this two ways personally. Am I going to look back on my deathbed and be happy with what I've done? And more importantly than that, from a legacy standpoint, are my kids who are modeling some of their behavior after me going to do the same thing? because that's what we're leaving for them. And I, I know this goes much further than just kind of tactically looking at the job search and career management, but that's the really important stuff. Because I mean, let's face it, your kids, they don't care whether you're good or what you do or not. What, what they are gonna see is how you've led your life, how you've managed it, and how you've been able to take care of all those other responsibilities you have. Amen, brother. I'm going to pause here and say we're going to be back with more from Kevin in, in just a moment. But first, my job search insider tip for this show. And this involves uh, the unintentional expression of bias in interviews. And it's become so obvious now that we have same-sex marriage in the United States. Now, I don't know how it is for you, but I know a lot of people uh, start to look to see whether or not there's a ring on someone's finger when they go in for an interview. And if it's a male, they make the assumption that the person is married to a woman. If it's a female, a man. But with same-sex marriage, the language has to change. And there are points where you may unintentionally refer to a wife or a husband that you're dealing with someone who doesn't have a wife or a husband, a woman who has a wife and a man who has a husband. So I just want to encourage you not to make the assumption about the orientation and the spouse of the other individual. I want to remind you that instead of doing that, refer to wife, husband, partner in all instances you will be safe do nothing to offend anyone and i i gotta tell you if you do offend them a lot of of gay individuals pause for a second and go okay they don't get it yet and that's fine and they put a distance up between you a little bit so just be conscious of your language and what its impact can wind up being so let's come back to Kevin, pick up where we left off. And you reminded me of a dear friend of mine uh, whose father and uncle, I believe, uh, were popular composers in the 1920s. And they were music, very successful. And when his uncle died, uh, this quantitative analyst uh, and I met and he spoke about not wanting to die with the music inside of him. You never know where that poetry resonates and, and what the impact is upon family, upon your kids uh, by doing the drudgery uh, and right. resenting it as, as you're doing it. And that's really the big thing. They see that you're not happy and they see that you're resigned to accepting your misery. You know, it, it, it reminds me, there's a there's a great interview with Steve Martin that Charlie Rose did, and he asked him about his success. And, and Steve Martin says, you know, everybody always wants to hear me say things like, here's how you get an agent. Here's how you star in a movie. Here's how you. And he said, the reality is this. Be so good that they can't ignore you. And the reason I share that is this stuff is hard work regardless. I, I tell my audience and I particularly tell folks when I, when I coach them, look, this is going to be hard work to get where you're going. The good news about hard work is twofold. Number one, lazy people, and there are a lot of them, are not going to do it. So that thins the herd right there. Second of all, if you don't have anything to truly contribute, if you don't have that music inside you, then then you've got nothing. So you are, you are narrowing the competition. But to come full circle back to what you said, if you are going to have to get in there and get in the muck and mire every day to produce these outcomes, shouldn't it be something that makes you feel good? I mean, it just to me doesn't make any sense. It's counterintuitive to do something that makes you absolutely miserable. And it doesn't matter about age on this because no, I not at all. Not at all. I know one of the criticisms of the older workers when they interview with younger workers is that they're jaded. Uh, and I think that comes across as being been there, done that. And 
you know, it, it kind of seems passe to them. Uh, and I think it's just the expression of that drudgery that shows up that, oh, yeah, another job, same place, you know, doing the same thing, yada, yada, yada. Well, I can, you know, one of the one of the missed opportunities, I think, for a lot of individuals who let's just say, let's put a number on it, say 25, 30 years experience. And and where this comes from, what I'm about to share is from the last search firm that I owned and I sold out of it in 2008. We place software sales executives with small software companies, so between five and $20 million. And what we found that those companies needed is that they needed someone. They typically were companies that had experienced some growth. They were now on a good trajectory, and the people that got them here were not the ones who were going to get them there. And what they needed is they needed somebody that could plug and play, needed minimal guidance, understood enough about the landscape to drive things up, didn't need a lot of large infrastructure, and could get deals done. What they needed was they needed people who had 30 plus years experience, the same group of people who were being passed over by some of the larger software companies that are looking for folks who, let's face it, are younger. And so when I run up against the resistance that people will say, well, it's age discrimination, I say, you know, Look, a discrimination on all different levels exists. You just brought that up in your in your tip. The reality is this, is that when you have, because boomers and millennials inverse the same problem, it's either more experience or no experience. When you have more experience, you've got to fine tune your message. You've got to decide out of a body of work of 30 years, where am I going to put my weight to bear for one, two, make no more than three significant problems? And that's what my message is centered around. You'll suss out opportunities better. They, they may not be full time. Consulting may be something that you need to seriously consider. You can certainly command more compensation and put all that aside. You can be doing this as a dual track in terms of helping a larger community through writing books, self-publishing, you know, taking this knowledge out and creating online courses, either create them yourself or, you know, use something like Udemy. There's an enormous opportunity out there and, and not only an enormous opportunity to, to help people in a way and cut down these barriers than there's ever been before, but it allows you to diversify where your revenue is coming in from, which I think is exceptionally important for everyone to do. Again, amen, brother. You know, th things have changed a lot. And if we rely upon one revenue source, whether it's a job uh, or one track of a business, uh, we're at risk. Well, and, I, and I'm sure you hear this all the time. When you hear people's motivation to move from one company to another, I, I certainly heard this as a headhunter. It was how people define security. And they would say, well, I want to move from a small company, which is doesn't have the security that a large company has. So I want to go to a publicly traded company. People in a publicly traded company would say, you know, I've seen the ups and downs of when analysts downgrade our, our stock and then people are getting laid off and it has nothing to do with performance. So I want to go to a smaller company. The reality is stability resides within you. And that's part of this concept of, of owning your career is making sure that you are focused on those outcomes, that you have good narratives around the outcomes and you understand the audience, those people who will hire you and pay for you to reproduce those outcomes for them. You know, during the last recession, I would tell people how insane they were to start looking at larger firms as a solution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stability resides within your skill set, within your capabilities and the product that you develop out of yourself. You know, to think that, as I said before, mommy and daddy, big corporation are looking out for you, that you go to your boss at mommy and daddy, big company and say, you hear anything, you hear anything. And they're 30 levels down. They don't know anything more than you do, but they give you the placebo. You know, you've got no security there, and it's been proven so often that economic factors will impact whether or not you've got a job or a career. So right. at, at the end of the day, you got to look out for your own marketability and your own interests and, and your own joy in life to, you know, to find that place where you can be extraordinary, you know, company independent. Absolutely. That's I mean, that that really, I think, is is the message here is that, you know, you can when you're looking for the conditions where you can exercise what it is you do exceptionally well, Seth Godin refers to it as being a linchpin. You can't just relinquish yourself to looking for someone else to create that opportunity for you. 
You know, the, the, so many people will start out and say there are no job openings. Well, going back to something I said earlier, there are plenty of people out there doing or supposedly doing what it is you can do better, but they aren't doing it well. And if their employer knew that there was a better option out there, they might trade up. So this comes down to messaging, not waiting and being reactive and seeing what is it that's out there, you know, to, to follow along kind of this real estate analogy of rent versus own, where's the best office space to go get? It's people who are currently in it and you just need to incentivize them to go somewhere else. Well, this is infinitely easier. You know, you don't look for the empty office space. That's that's not a very good harbinger of, of, uh, <laughs> of location, right? I mean, it's just it's just not. You're, you're looking for that space that you want to get into and somebody else wants to upgrade into something else. Do you stay on the beaten path or do you go off the beaten path? Again, using the real estate analogy. I, you know, I don't, I don't know that there, that there's a, a, a distinction or, or a difference between the two. I, I think it's a matter of consistently getting your message out there. And doing that regardless of whether you are looking for a job or not looking for a job. You, you know, again, you know, this is a headhunter. The best, the best talent out there is always listening to the things that you have to share and you have to say in, in large part because they want to maintain a relationship with you. And they know if they stay on your radar, they're never going to have to pick up the phone and call you. The same goes with your message of, of constantly being able to share value, to learn what other people are doing. So you know where you are on the curve, but that other people know out there what your message is, what you're great at, and they'll help share it as well. So you spoke about message and constantly being out there. So... I, I first want you to define message, and, and I think the way you've set it up until this point is really you know, to simplify it, know who you are, know what you're best at, know what you love doing. Yeah, I always start out with this exercise, which is kind of a 30,000-foot view on what you do. Um, and I, it's exceptionally important as an individual to be able to share it, but also to empower the people around you with a, a, a nice clean, concise message that they can share, that they truly understand. Because how, how many people do you know that you you kind of tangentially get what it is that they do, but you don't completely understand what they do? You know, and, and that comes back to the individual. So it goes like this. It's what I call the X, Y, Z technique. I help X, X is the audience, do or understand why, why is that problem that you solve, so that Z, Z is the outcome you want them to help them achieve. So X is identifying who that group of people is that you help, who are the, and, and this is typically the individuals you're going to work for. And where I go in on this is, is less, you know, I help controllers, I help project managers, I help sales managers, then think about the problems that they have. So we'll back up the individual themselves, what type of company are they working in? You know, getting niching this down as much as possible so that when you say I help X, this group, this audience, do or understand why, why that problem is the thing that is keeping them up at night. It's that thing that's standing between them and a promotion, them and a raise, them and possibly keeping their job. And the so that Z, Z is that outcome they're seeking. What does the world look like when this problem is solved? Amazing. I've facilitated men's retreats around the country for many years, and there's a model for, for creating a personal mission uh, that involves vision plus action equals mission. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's what you just laid out so succinctly there. It's beautiful. Glad you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is really the place for you to discover uh, where things are congruent for you. What really will allow you to heal some of the stuff that bothers you and, and, and be of service to others. Absolutely. After all, you don't want to be doing pointless work. You want to be doing purposeful things. And folks, in the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing more shows about purpose uh, and really connecting with the things that have meaning to, to you as part of your job search and part of your career planning. So keep an eye out for those shows. I've got some nice guests lined up. But back to Kevin. So we've got 
Owning versus renting. Now, what about the fearful renter who's afraid to put the down payment down of time and effort to be able to own? You know, I, there's a, I don't know if it's a Buddhist saying or where it comes from. The obstacle is the path. And you can physiologically get into and psychologically get into understanding why it is that we resist change. You know, the amygdala firing up, which is our lizard brain going back to when we came out of the primordial soup, you know, fight or flight versus your prefrontal prefrontal cortex, which actually gets really fired up when we do new things. And those two things being at odds. So I, what I say is when, when you, find yourself in that situation where you where fear is kicking in it's an opportunity to sit back and reflect and understand why and not just say whoa whoa, whoa, i can't do that because take a minute and and look this this is a process guys i mean like it can it can take a while to figure this out take a look at what is that thing that's standing between you and where you want to go because that that is the thing that you that therein lies the path that's what you've got to work over you've got to work around sometimes it's the opportunity itself to get where it is that you're headed you're a parent right i am (laughs) one of the biggest jobs as a parent is helping your child overcome their fears absolutely and it's our time to parent ourselves or to get support and be parented in order to break through the self-imposed limitations that are based on some place in our history that we don't probably remember. But we've got to break through because otherwise we're, we're in a box. Who wants to live in a box? Right. Well, you'll, you'll hear performers say this all the time about getting up on stage and feeling exceptionally anxious, being terrified, and then they start and they get into it and they're good to go. And it's a constant reminder that, that the way that you mitigate fear is by not getting rid of it, but consciously deciding that it's not going to stand between you and that outcome you want to achieve, which means you have to be able to identify when it rears its head. You've got to know what that feels like, and you've got to pay close attention to it. So true. You you also spoke about something, and, and I ran past it a little bit, that translates into personal branding. And you know, we've, we did a show about that more than a year ago that folks you can find in the archives. But if you were talking with this individual about branding themselves, I know you gave the mission statement. Uh, summary, but if someone wants to concretize it or concretize it, that may be a correct pronunciation, how would they begin that process of, of figuring out how to build, uh, how to identify their brand before they go out and try building it? Yeah, you know, that's a really important question because so many people, and and I, I run into this in a webinar training that I do all the time where I lay out that XYZ technique and people immediately start firing back, which, you know, here's what I came up with. And they're doing this on the fly while we're in the midst of the webinar, which I think is great, by the way. I mean, it just tells me that it's resonating. But the important thing, and I remember going through this myself when I came out of the military as an infantry officer and I was transitioning to the civilian sector. And that was the things that I thought were important and valued are great but I'm never gonna hire me. So the best place for anyone to start is to go back and talk to people you've worked for, you've worked with, clients you've interacted with, and ask these questions, and, it, and I'll, get, I'll get down to the nitty gritty. I would use something like Skype, and I would download a Skype recorder, and I'd record these calls, because you've gotta do a tremendous amount of listening, and asking questions like, what is it that I did for you that you found exceptionally valuable? Why, why? What was it about that that was so great? What did that do for you? This, again, if you go back and think of that construct of this X, Y, Z, is you, even if you're shifting industries like I was, I was never going to find anything like I had in the infantry, in the civilian sector, at least nothing that was legal, right? So um, I was looking for leaders, for managers, for folks who were going to hire me that were dealing with similar problems, that had similar mindsets, that valued similar things. And I didn't realize this at the time, but that's what it was creating. So it's something that I use all the time with clients who are moving from one industry to another and saying, I'm really clear on where I'm coming from. I think I know where I want to go, but 
I don't know if they value what it is that I have. And, and the, the truthful answer is I don't either. So we've got to test this stuff. You've got to come up with these stories. You've got to come up with the things that you think are valuable that you have. And we've got to go find out if this other area, this other new audience values what it is that you do. Amen, brother. You know, we don't have a lot of time left today, and I want to make sure that if there are any other points or a summary you want to express uh, that you haven't gotten to yet, that we cover that. And then my interviewing hasn't gotten in the way of that. So. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, big, the big thing that I would say, and, and this may sound a little trite, but... <clears throat> You've got to take control of this. If, if, no, if, if you don't take control of it, somebody else will, because there is, your day is being dictated to you daily. And in the vacuum of taking charge of it, someone else will. And it's not easy. It's not easy, but as trite as it sounds, life is entirely too short not to be doing what you love. And that's all I'd say. That's, that is the main focus that I have on a daily basis for everybody that I write for and the videos that I'll shoot and all the work that I do. That's, that's what it's centered around. And I know it's not for everybody, but that's okay. If that's what resonates with you, that's where I like to dig in. A lifetime is not a long time. This is true. Kevin, thank you. How can people find out more about you and the work that you do? The best place is just to go to my website or Facebook page, and it's kevinkermis.com. You can see it down below, K-E-V-I-N-K-E-R-M-E-S.com. Super. Kevin, thanks for making time. I really appreciate it. Hey, Jeff, thanks so much for thinking of me and having me on again. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And folks, we'll be back next time with another terrific guest with lots to share with you. I'm Jeff Alpin. Hope you found this helpful. I also want to encourage you to visit my site, which is TheBigGameHunter.us. There's a lot there that you can watch, listen to, or read to help you find your next position more clearly. More quickly, I should say. And if we are connected on LinkedIn, send a connection request to me at uh, the uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash the big game hunter. So hope you enjoyed today's job search radio. Hope you have a great week. Take care. For more job search advice, visit Jeff's website at the big game hunter.us. That's the big game hunter.us.